thanks so much for joining us. Uh, we're super excited to be having this conversation with May Martin. Hi, May. Hi, how are you? Good, how are you? I'm good. I miss Canada, so it's nice to hear your accent. Oh, yeah. You know what? I didn't think about it until I was watching your show, and I was like, yeah, we do have an accent. We yeah, 100%. Have well, I have now that weird Atlantic I've been in London for 10 years, so I still I have this weird British lilt, but I really don't want to sound like Madonna, so I'm I'm fighting it. I'm you trying to stay. Madonna. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> don't do it. Um, just for everyone who's joining us, um, my name is Devin Murphy. I'm an arts journalist and storyteller. Um, I'm doing this takeover for Extra Magazine today from Banff National Park, where I'm based in Alberta. Um, Extra is a Toronto-based LGBTQ2S focused digital publication. Um, and today we're speaking with creator and star of the show Feel Good, May. So May, tell us a bit more about uh, how you're passing this time in isolation and then we're not gonna talk about the coronavirus after that. Okay, okay, yeah, we'll touch on it. And then, yeah, I mean, I'm, I think I'm just like everyone else. I'm, I'm like up and down, you know? Sometimes I'm, I wake up and I'm so productive and I'm like, I'm gonna go for a run and do work and then other days I'm, I can't get out of bed so it's uh, like moment to moment you know really yeah. getting to know my roommate better than I ever thought I would <laughs> we're I'm thinking about the people who have like Craigslist roommates right now being like your best best friends now or enemies yeah exactly yeah yeah well she's she's a friend of a friend but we did like last night things are getting we're on the brink of things getting a bit weird in our minds so yesterday we did a ceremony for the full moon and we had crystals and stuff this is very on me but i'm like all right if <laughs> yeah yeah i've just been like baking a lot of bread and like grinding um my night guard until it's cracked oh god yeah <laughs> oh my god <laughs> my two hobbies yeah um Cool. Well, uh, I think we've got a majority of Canadians and Brits watching here because we're like 2 p.m., 7 p.m. Uh, and I feel like Feel Good really plays to both. And I was wondering just from, and you've been in England for 10 years, you know, what are some of the differences between Canadian and English senses of humor? Like, how do you play to both? I think they're pretty similar. I think, um, yeah, I, I grew up my dad's British and I think there's a lot of crossover with British and Canadian comedy because it's, I, I think, I mean, these are huge generalizations, but it's sort of self-deprecating and um, there's people in, in England and Canada, I think get very uncomfortable when, when anyone is not self-deprecating <laughs> and is, you know, pointing outward. So it's a lot of pointing inward. And uh, yeah, I found it not a huge culture clash moving here comedy wise. Yeah comedy wise what yeah. about otherwise otherwise I guess I found I think I, I grew up in Toronto and and I I was in a very queer scene and um and then moving here I just all my friends are comedians and and I haven't found that that scene yet and it, it does feel like Toronto's kind of like 10 years ahead of a, a lot of places in terms of those scenes integrating and the fluidity of of all that so I, I did feel a bit like, uh, yeah. Still, yeah. Still seeking it out. Yeah. Yeah. I, I mean, I have my comedy community and that's the best. Yeah. That's important. Yeah. Um, okay. So super excited to talk about your show. Feel good. Uh, last I checked, it had a 100% fresh rating on Rotten Tomatoes, which I have, I don't think I've ever seen before. Um, and I saw a quote from the critics consensus that called it at once sweetly charming, uncomfortably complicated and completely worth falling for, which in my head, I was like, that is an ideal dating profile. Like, yeah, I'm, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so I put that on my, on my Tinder. Yeah. Tinder. If you haven't already made it your Tinder, that's definitely it. Um, yeah. I want to talk a little bit about like the show. So largely based on your life, when did you first imagine that it could be a series? So I did a stand up, an hour of stand up at the Edinburgh Fringe Festival um, called Dope, and it was all about addiction and relationships and where those two things intersect. And then um, Channel Four in England, I think I'd been pitching stuff and scripted stuff for years, and all of it was very bad and and very high concepts. Like we're on Mars, there's a, a battle, um, yeah, a who done it. I sat at a house party and then um, they approached me and said, can you just write something really personal based on those themes? And so then I teamed up with uh, my co-writer, Joe Hampson, who we'd already been writing together. He's my best friend. And we knew it should be a love story because um, 
all of my 20s have been consumed by intense relationships and it just seemed like a natural and a great framework on which to hang those those other themes you know absolutely and then how did the process actually unfold you know you wrote it you conceived of it how did it become the series it is now we did a pilot so we we wrote the pilot filmed a pilot in 2017 with um with charlotte ritchie playing george as well and that was a very very useful exercise because um we learned a lot and we learned about the characters and then we then pitched that pilot around and, and sold the series and no one will ever see that pilot, which is probably, I, it's not that it's bad, but I think we hadn't quite found it yet. And, um, and so that was really good. And then, yeah, Netflix came on board and uh, so it's a co-production and yeah. That's wonderful. Thanks. Um, <laughs> I'm I'm always like uh interested in when people write characters that feel like so much like themselves but you know it's actually a character it's not that person. I'm wondering what are some differences between May the character and May the you. Well, I've been saying in interviews a lot that May the character is so much more manic and I'm actually very chill <laughs> but as I said that, I just realized that my leg under this table is going like, dig -a -dig -a -dig -a -dig -a -dig. so I'm like, well, um, but <laughs> yeah, I think I, May, the character is kind of where I was at about 10 years ago. So she doesn't have a very good handle on her sobriety or um, her relationships and her addictive behaviors. And I think I have a better handle on it. And um, she's like, I mean, like many comic characters, she's totally unself-aware. So we, the audience, kind of see exactly what she should do to work her shit out, and, and she, does, she doesn't see it. Yeah, that's, it would be boring if she was self-aware. Totally. Get anywhere. Yeah. Um, were there, like, certain ways that you would get into character on set, just to be, like, a more extreme version of yourself? I had a lot of adrenaline anyway coursing through my veins, but, yeah, I, I found, uh, I've never acted before, and so even in, in writing, I found it a, a lot easier to write the other characters, and. Um, because it is hard to think what's funny about yourself and it feels weirdly navel gazy. And so I was lucky I had Joe, my co-writer, to kind of remind me what annoying things I do and <laughs> what's weird about me. Um, and then I kind of found, I, in rehearsals, found found that what level of, of energy and stuff, I guess. And then did I do anything to get into character? Before specific scenes, like, this is the thing, because like because I've never acted or done anything like this, I don't know what's normal. So I was doing things like jumping up and down a lot, like before scenes. But I don't know if that's normal. Or like before the um, this is a spoiler, but before the breakup scene, I stopped talking to Charlotte a, a couple of hours before, which really stressed her out. But I thought that I was like, I can't be joking and talking. You know what I mean? Yeah. And then I put in headphones and listen to the saddest music, and then. Um, for, for like a few hours, you know, like a trigger moment. You're like, let's just go back to a bad time. Yeah. Yo, oh my God. Totally. Yeah, totally. What do you remember what you were listening to? Yes. I was listening to nothing. You say, Fuck. What's the song called? Am I allowed to swear? Sorry. Yeah. Yeah. It's yeah. Actually, yeah. It's the internet, right? Yeah. It's fine. It's the internet. Um, yes. An, uh, an emphatic yes. Wait, can I, it just feels good being in your office. I'm running with you. Downtown by Magical Clouds. Okay. And he, throw it on your sadness playlist. Yeah, down and it's Magical Clouds is something like M A J I K A L or something. But it, he's he's Canadian. Okay, cool. A lot of Canadian music on the soundtrack too. I used a lot of uh, Half Moon Run Good. and um, yeah. Great soundtrack. Thank you. Um, I'm just getting a note here that we have people joining us from Argentina, Peru, Greece, Canada, England. If you want to say hi to everybody who's joining us. Thank you, everyone. Hi, everyone. Um, <laughs> Yasu to the Greek people. Hola, <laughs> Hola Argentina. Um, so kind of speaking of audiences, I was wondering, because acting's new to you um, on a set and you're used to stand-up comedy, what was it like performing without that kind of first person audience reaction, like happening right away? That's such a good question. Yeah, it was really unsettling to say a, a line that I think is really funny and then have the crew just be completely expressionless. And um, yeah, so that was definitely unsettling, but I, I got I got used to it. I, I really loved, stand-up is such a solitary 
endeavor and it's just you and and so i loved um having other people to to bounce off of and adapt with and react to that was very nice because it's especially also ending the day of filming and being able to go and have a glass of wine with everyone different than being on tour or doing stand-up you, you, you get off stage and you just have your own thoughts yeah oh god and you're like how'd i do i don't know yeah <laughs> um were there any favorite scenes to film just because you had that collaborative back and forth energy yeah loads um i really i loved doing everything with lisa kudrow was so fun and amazing and she's so funny and um that was very surreal for me because i'm such a huge fan and uh there was a scene where i'm trying to do an apology to my parents and they don't want to listen and she's she says i'm in the middle of my scotch egg and uh the way she said it was so unexpected that i just couldn't keep it together so that was really fun and funny and then tons of the stuff with, with charlotte who, who oh, plays the random moment god how'd you even film that that was really annoying because i was laughing so much and charlotte was improvising she was but we told her to improvise but she was saying stuff in my ear that was meant to be sexy in that susan sarandon voice but it was she was saying the most ridiculous things that made no sense and then i'd laugh and then i'd get in trouble and uh because the schedule was so tight so yeah i laughed a lot but i, I really liked filming the slow dancing scene in uh episode four at the end that felt weirdly more intimate than some of the sex scenes it was like just hours of slow dancing with someone and that felt really like a, a powerful moment for the characters and a really nice moment just to connect with someone in that way was nice yeah it seems like even in the acting there's so much vulnerability i mean aside from the fact that you're telling your own personal story and i saw that you said that like in comedy the most vulnerable parts are kind of the most relatable so you go there um but i'm wondering what it's like to hear all this critique and praise about a story that's ostensibly about your life it's so personal what's that been like oh amazing so so, so validating obviously and and cathartic in lots of ways also really strange and uh strange yeah you know things like addiction and um that's things that are that are really personal or there's a there's a line in that breakup scene where i talk about gender identity and that was something that i hadn't even said out loud to people in my life but i put it in the scripts because it's good drama and then uh so I, even writing it i didn't think about a how hard it would be to say it out loud and then now it, what's amazing is people are really connecting to that line and to that scene and but they're making tons of like memes of it and it's such a personal thing but and i'm getting these memes and like uh people being like i'm not a boy i'm not even a girl i'm a failed version of both which is you know like a, a vulnerable thing to say but it's really great that people are connecting but people are sending me like videos of that scene over so i'm like oh god like, yeah. oh yeah <laughs> that's really interesting that you wrote something that was like inside of your head that you hadn't even really talked about and how what is it easier somehow for a character to kind of express those thoughts first yeah i'm sure yeah definitely definitely yeah Love did it, did it feel like a therapeutic -y kind of thing like it doesn't feel like i feel like some pieces of art that are about catharsis like you can feel that it's therapy this didn't feel like that to me but did it have that kind of feeling for you while you're working on it well i think like you said that you can sometimes feel that it's just a therapeutic exercise for someone and, and we really wanted to make sure that that wasn't the case so me and my co-writer were constantly checking in and making sure that it, it never felt like to, yeah, to navel gazing, and, and we wanted to make sure that my character was also really badly behaved and occasionally unlikable and things like that. So it was um, so making it. I was so focused on the series and all the other characters and all that that it didn't feel very therapeutic. But then I think watching the final edited, like I was in the edit, and then when we were finally finished and all the music was in it, and I watched it, that felt very cathartic to think that I had these things that I wanted to say and I've said them and it's out there now you know yeah and it's so nice to see it all come together like I'm sure as you're making it, it it's it feels like that and then you get to see the edit and the music and you're like oh it's this is real like it's real it came together yeah absolutely and and I, it really turned out pretty closely to how it was in my brain and that's 
partly because of our amazing uh, director, Ali Penku, who is Canadian and um, a good friend and someone I've known since I was about 19. So we were very in tune as well. And, and Joe, my co-writer, was on set. So I think, yeah, we had a pretty rare, it yeah. really felt like a group of people that really get along oh, like, with a singular vision, you know? That's wonderful. Um, I feel like with a lot of kind of queer related shows, you have this like built in audience because a lot of people are kind of starved for content that was starring people that looks like them. Uh, I'm wondering how you as a viewer have seen queer representation change in film and television over the years, you know, up until now where you've kind of added to this canon. I definitely grew up feeling that lack of representation, but not, not knowing that I felt that you know, when you're a teenager, it didn't really occur to me, but um, looking back, like I would have been, I mean, I, I think I said somewhere else, but when Willow on Buffy was gay, I was so grateful and like so overjoyed, but I couldn't, I didn't relate to those characters. They're like, they're witches. First of all, they're witches. Second of all, like neither of them felt like, like me, but I was still so grateful. So yeah, ravenously ready for it. Um, and then, yeah, I, I guess, with with things that are more authored and written by queer people, the the queer characters that we're seeing, I think, are allowed to be flawed and and complicated and have their sexuality just be one aspect of their identity rather than, you know, their whole story being that they're trying to come out or that they, you know, are a victim in some way. So, yeah, yeah, yeah. I want to touch on that a bit later. Also, yeah. R. P. Tara. What's Sorry. that? Oh, yeah. You I know mean, what? I was ready to see her go. Hard for Willow. It was hard for Willow, and I never want to see Willow in pain. But I never want to see her in pain. Not yeah. after. Not a, not again. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Willow, I, I, that was an addiction storyline, wasn't it? It was. Oh my god! Her eyes are all black. Terrifying. Very scary. Um, I'm wondering what was important for you, like just based on what you were just saying, what was important for you to get right in terms of queer representation? Because it felt to me, um, I feel like sometimes it's so on the nose or it's like trying too hard. It felt super true, super casual. We're seeing strap-ons, we're seeing rolled up t-shirt sleeves, we're seeing you hauling, like all of these things. But it wasn't like, ha ha ha, she moved in. It's like, this is just what's going on. And it felt really real. And I'm wondering what was important for you to get right about that? I think um, we just, I mean, and I think this is true in, in my stand-up as well, is I, I, all I know is my own experience. And I, I try to never speak to anyone else's. And, and it can be hard because often you're, you're asked to. If you, yeah, you know what I mean? But I thought if I just stay as true to my own experience, then I know that there'll be a, a truth there that'll come through and hopefully people will, will connect with. Um, because I'm certain I'm not the only one that feels these things, but I, you know what I mean? So one thing was um, uh, I wanted to talk about, rather than having the main story be homophobia, about internalized homophobia and internalized shame, which I think both these characters are really riddled with shame. And um, that that's, you know, because I'm such a proud member of this community and like a very outspoken, kind of spoken about sexuality and gender and stuff. But of course I, you know, I grew up in this world. So I, I have all these shards of shame. So I wanted to express that, I guess. And then, yeah, I, I don't know, uh, sex scenes. I, I wanted it to not feel voyeuristic. And um, there's so much going on mentally for those characters in those scenes that it was really important that we, like Ali, our director, made sure that she really shot we were up close with them and the, the the plot was moving forward in those scenes and that they were kind of messy and yeah, yeah why do you I forget, to be honest I forget the question and I feel like I've been rambling for about 10 minutes no I, not at all no I don't, you're good you're good I I was just like I you flowed right into my next kind of question which is why do you like to me that felt novel like the sex was normal and yeah it was like cool and regular and, and also funny and we're learning about the characters but like why do you think that feels so novel like I don't know that I see that in any other queer shows I watch yeah that might be to do with who's writing it or who's behind the camera but I I, I don't know I'm, I'm trying yeah I think um I think it might be that thing about authored authored work and and people who've lived that experience making it I, yeah. I don't know I, I 
yeah, yeah. I, it's interesting though. There, there is uh, when because there's so little representation. When when you make something, there's a, a more scrutiny on it to be sort of doing the best job of you know what I mean. Yeah, and the sort of pressure. And so that's been that's been interesting. Like some people I saw on I'm obsessively reading everything that people write, and I saw I saw some people saying that it, the show was biphobic. Um, and that was interesting to me because to me, like I'm, I'm by, um, both characters are by, but I think the characters struggle with biphobia. My character is a flawed character. So she, she can't handle George being by like, so we were, I was trying to show, to show that not to celebrate biphobia, but to show that these characters struggle with, with that sometimes, but that, yeah. So things like that where I'm like, Oh, it, it is, when making it you have to kind of tune everything out and think how do I tell this story in the most multifaceted and honest way yeah I, I I was thinking a lot about that and I wasn't really sure how to phrase it but I feel like I was going to ask if there is some pressure to be like uh you, you know you want to tell a well-rounded story but also you want to be like hey there's not that many queer stories so I want this one to be happy and I want to show people yeah. that we're like good and normal or whatever uh I was wondering if you were feeling that pressure so that's really interesting to hear yeah I, and i think i have to just um to you know I, I read everything but it is hard like a lot of people I, not a lot i've read a couple of people saying oh god this this relationship is so toxic it's so annoying that it's so but that's sort of the point of this show and the show is the point is not look at this toxic queer couple the point is look at this these characters one of whom is an addict and is it's as much a show about addiction as it is about sexuality and it's about the way we relate to each other and also, you know, my co-writer, it's experiences that he's felt as well. Like it's, I think those things are pretty universal. And yeah. so in no way am I saying this is the queer experience. I'm saying this is a way that human beings relate to each other and that can be, yeah, anyway. Yeah, it must be tough to like uh, all of a sudden become a spokesperson of some kind. Especially when you don't have a, the answer. <laughs> like I don't, yeah because of the content of the show, a lot of the interviews are, you know, about gender identity and um, addiction. And I, I have a lot of ambiguity in my own brain about those things. So I, I don't know, just try and, just try and not have all the answers, May. Come on. Yeah. <laughs> just wade through it. Um, I just have a couple more questions uh, and then we're going to get to some audience questions. So I have a couple of in over here. Um, if you want to type your questions, Erica Lenti is going to pass them my way and then I'll ask them to me. Um, just a couple more though. Uh, the show is super funny, super romantic. Uh, episode four, which airs tonight in the UK, I thought had one of the best romantic speeches. Uh, to me, that was kind of the like John Cusack holding up the boombox moment. Thank you. Um, think we need more grand romantic gestures portrayed in queer romances do I think we do yeah oh I don't know I mean I'm I'm just really romantic and and I I'm just like a diehard romantic so I, I wanted it to be c cinematic in that way I, I mean you know I grew up watching Romeo and Juliet Titanic like these are you know so to get Leo, to be are you a Leo fan do I pick up on a Leo moment big Leo theme yeah I wanted to be him I wanted to be with him very confusing um clothes I want to touch his hair yeah yeah exactly so yeah I I love a big romantic gesture I thought that was great. I, to me, like, as I was watching that moment, I was like, this is going to be like the kind of thing people write in like a Valentine's card to someone, you know, like it was like a very pure. Oh, thanks. I, I think that people can relate to that feeling of, of not being in the right place and, uh, or, or feeling restless. And, and like, there's, you're going to find some moment where you find this hole that's shaped like you and you can be in it. And yeah. Oh, that's good. I'm glad you like that. Yeah. I loved it. Um, and then I guess we kind of already touched on this a bit, but it is, it is just so nice to see queer characters with a full range of emotion. Like they're not sidekicks. They're not just like sexy objects. Um, they're all the way people. Uh, and why do you think it's important to be honest about the, the hard parts of being queer or trying out new relationships? Um, but also to show queer joy. Uh, well, I guess you it would be weird not to show the full spectrum of the human experience that, that we all have. Yeah. 
I, I, I definitely think it's important that we're allowed to be flawed and not and, and show that. I think, um, yeah. I think that it sounds like a weird question, but I guess the more media I consume, the more I'm like, but they're not most most characters aren't like that. Like they don't have, they're either yeah. just like, a, you know, side characters or maybe they're just like having sex and fun, but yes. it's like a person. Yeah. The, and the joy thing is, is important too. And, and it, yeah, like it, it was important to us that we, we go down a, a path where we think, Oh my God, George's friends and her mom are, are going to be so homophobic. And then the reality is that they're not at all. And, and everybody's sort of fine with it. So, yeah. So, that's a, that's a nice thing to see, I think. Yeah, it felt like a lot of like pointing inwards to be like, what what have you internalized before you kind of put that on other people? What like what have you absorbed into yourself? So that was really nice. Yeah, and I've had that experience a lot in, in well, a handful of times in relationships with people who've never been in same-sex relationships before and, and, and say, oh, I couldn't possibly tell this person because they, you know, judge me. And it often turns out not to be the case. And it's just, it's something else. Excellent. Can we ask what is next for May the character and May you? Well, it hasn't been officially recommissioned yet, the show. So me and Joe are, are writing. We've written three episodes. And we're, if, yeah, if you like the show, please tweet about it. And um, we just want to see if that relationship can transform itself from a toxic one into a, a more long term one. Um, I'm interested to see if May, the character, actually wants to figure her shit out or if she's more comfortable in discomfort and um, I want to go to Canada for a bit. You know, we've got loads, loads of stuff, but no spoilers. Are we going to see like the big nickel in our, in our future episode? Oh my God, the big nickel. I was just yeah. trying to think of Canadian like, iconic. I mean, I guess the CN Tower would have made more sense. Why did, I Why did you go to Sudbury? Yeah. I don't know, because probably it's cheap to film there. That's true, actually. Yeah, I'd love to go and film at my old summer camp in um, Algonquin Park. Oh, lovely. And, yeah, be by a lake and uh, get in the forest. I feel like those characters, May and George, have never set foot in nature. Like, they just seem, like, so in their heads and their phones. And so or, I would love to put them in nature and see what happens. Yeah, I would pay to watch those two go camping. Yeah. <laughs> um, okay, great. Are you okay to take some audience questions? Yeah, great. Let's do it. Um, Marissa Cho asks, who are some of your favorite stand-up comedians? Oh, great question. Maria Bamford, Tig Notaro, Sarah Silverman, Chelsea Peretti. Um, yeah, those are my favorites right now, but but loads. I, I grew up watching Eddie Izzard and um, um, yeah, loads. There's tons that, um, there's a Toronto comedian called Chris Locke that I find very hilarious. There's tons of people in London I find hilarious. Uh, Sabrina Jalice, um, Fortune Feimster, um, Lisa Traeger, loads of people. Yeah. Excellent. Um, Teresa Chu asks, who came up with the name of the show and what was the inspiration for the title Feel Good? It was such a long process. We had so many titles and um it was really down to the wire where it was like if you don't come up with a title we're gonna call the show may which really struck fear into my heart that would have been awful so um i think it was actually a com our commissioner at channel four we had a group phone call and we were throwing out ideas and um yeah i think i think she said i think one of us said feeling good and she said feel good um but there were lots of other ideas pelicans was one um <laughs> They're all bad ideas. Say Yes was another one, which is an Elliot Smith song that I like. Can you see my Elliot Smith album? Yes. I'm a big fan. Um, yeah. I just wanted to take people's song lyrics and steal them. So I really wanted to call it Everything Goes Right, which is a song that we use in the show. It bookends the show by Charles Watson. And I love that phrase because nothing goes right for those characters. But you can't just steal people's songs. Yeah, no, you're right. <laughs> <laughs> and I feel like feel good really set you up for a lot of great press. Yes, thank like, you. I feel good watching this, and you're like, yeah. nice. Yeah. Headline. Also, I guess the the reason behind that name was that all of the characters in the show are just trying to trying to feel good, and that's a, a a kind of a novel way to frame addiction. I think is to actually think, what are people trying to 
to do well they're obviously not feeling very good in the moment and they're looking for relief and self-soothing with whatever and um yeah all right um bridget marie underwood asks what was the hardest scene for you to film and why bridget um it, it was the breakup scene yeah yeah i i it was the breakup scene because i was really nervous about it because i really cared about it and i really wanted it to be good and i don't i'm not good i haven't acted i'm scared of, i find it really scary so i just was so afraid that we wouldn't get there in the amount of takes that we had um but then charlotte is so amazing and um and I was very t sad, so it it came together. I think I'm really happy with it in the end, but it was awful to film. At the end of it, we were so exhausted, kind of. Yeah, like a real breakup. Yeah, yeah, we, we then went, uh, Charlotte came to my hotel room and we drank wine and we played, uh, I had a, a keyboard and a guitar and we played U2, I think she was playing the keyboard and I was, and we just like silently played U2. And then she was like, well, good night. And uh, <laughs> it cheered me up, like shook it off, you know? Okay, yeah, I'll try that. I'm gonna try that. Um, Amisha Abilak asks, what books or series are you reading or watching right now? Um, I mean, like everybody, I watched Tiger King and found it insane. I am watching Search Party. Um, I'm re-watching just movies that I find comforting. I'm just, I'm like right now, pure escapism. So anything that will hold my attention and I'm finding it kind of hard to watch comedy because my mind wanders. And so I've been watching kind of erotic nineties thrillers with Michael Douglas, um, which they're so, oh, sorry. Um, yeah, they're so problematic, but they keep your attention, you know? <laughs> yeah. And I was actually wondering what, was there anything you were watching or reading while you were creating the show that kind of inspired you or maybe that you can see some little infusions of? The, the thing that I was reading while writing it was um, Gabor Mate uh, in the realm of hungry ghosts. And, and he's an addiction specialist and a physician and a writer. And, and I was watching a lot of his stuff and and uh, I like what he says about addiction. And then during filming, again, just escapism, like I, Charlotte and I watched Jumanji uh, uh, and we we watched Ghosts, which is a, an amazing British show that she's in that was airing at, at the time. And uh, I just watched, I watched Summer Heights High, uh, you know, things that cheer me up, yeah. Excellent. Um, let's see here. Uh, Sophia Saria asks, is there an official source where we can have the soundtrack for Feel Good? I, I don't know what the official thing is. I have a, I have it on Spotify, but I don't know if I have a public profile. I got to look into it, but I did tweet the soundtrack of a Spotify playlist. So if you search on Spotify, Feel Good soundtrack, I think it comes up. Maybe someone would check, but I, I think it's out there or just tweet at me and I'll, I'll send it to you. Sophia, go check out uh, Spotify. Yeah. Um, what else do we? What else do we have here? Good stuff on there. Um, Caitlin McKinnon asked, "What did your mom think about being, I mean, portrayed-ish by Lisa Kudrow?" Um, so, uh, that my mom is very different to that character, and my mom is very sweet and and loving, but quite powerful in the way that that character is, like a, sort of iconic to me um so yeah i think she found she found it hilarious she, we're all big lisa kudrow fans and i was nervous about them seeing it and then i sent it to them before it came out and um they loved it and they're they're so sweet and supportive and i've watched it a lot and now my mom's quoting that character like she said on the phone the other day she was like i mean what i say and that's like a that's a, a lisa kudrow line so that was good we'll have to send her a scotch egg for mother's day yeah when is mother's day I think it's in May. It's okay, May, like one. early May. You're fine. You're fine. Okay. Um, you can't go outside anyway. I'm very aware that my face is like shiny, but this is a deep insecurity of mine. So I'm like, no, no, a, like a glossier, like a a youthful glow. You know. Uh, okay. <laughs> no, you're good. You're not shiny. Um, Carmen De Silva asks, "What is the most romantic gesture a partner has done for you, or you've done for another person as a romantic?" I 
notoriously don't date romantic people and I'm I am I'm the one doing the gestures I think um but I'm which I'm into um so I've done I mean that, in the show I got into the bath with all my clothes on and that's something I did um one time I was having dinner with well, wait does it sound like I'm just saying that I'm so romantic and but I don't know I went for dinner with with my ex and I I had given the um, restaurant a CD of like all her favorite songs. Um, but all the, actually the, the boys that I've dated have been way more romantic than the girls. All the girls I did are quite like, uh, but uh, the boys that I've dated are, you know, flowers and nice. <laughs> I don't know. Yeah. And you're like trying to be as romantic. Is that, does the dynamic change? Yeah. Maybe the dynamic changes a bit and I get to kind of receive that romance a bit. I don't know. It's fluid. It's fluid. It's fluid, you know. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, whatever. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Betty generally asks, were, were there any deleted scenes that didn't make the final cut that you really wish had made it into the series? So many, yeah. We really, um, again, having never written a, a scripted series, me and my co-writer just didn't know a page, <laughs> like the episodes were way too long, basically, and we had to cut um, tons of stuff. Um, yeah, there was a great scene that I really liked where, where my character went to the gym to try to get massive and be strong and uh, bumps into Kevin, the businessman from Narcotics Anonymous in the gym. And uh, they have this exchange that, that was funny. So I, that was a shame to lose that. But um, yeah, very we, we were trying to tell that story so economically. So it really kind of clips along. <laughs> Um, okay, one last question. Michelle Kretsch asks, what is your favorite Celine Dion song? <laughs> uh, it's all coming back to me now? Yeah. Yeah, right? That's the right answer. Yeah, 100%. Yeah, yeah I think so. I mean, that music video... Is... Endless Pleasure? Okay. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. I think, yeah, I love Celine. Um, have you ever seen... If you, if you go on YouTube and types, I think... It's Celine Dion is amazing, and it's a, a, a yes. you know, that it's yeah. like edited just clips of her backstage um, doing all kinds of outrageous things and voices, and uh, she's a real character. Yeah, I think I was I was in New Orleans uh, staying with my friend, and it was it was like Canada Day or Celine Dion's birthday or some day, and none of them had ever seen that clip. So we just sat, made the whole house sit down and watch it, and they were like, "Why did you make us do this?" And we were like, "This is our culture." That's incredible. That's one of my favorite YouTube videos. And another one is, should I say this? I don't know. But there's a video, if you type in Trudeau's wife sings, it's Justin Trudeau's wife singing a song that she wrote um, a cappella at a... Uh, like at a hospital or something? At, it's Martin Luther King Day and it's a oh. civil rights kind of thing. And she's like, okay, <laughs> I wasn't going to do this, but I'm going to sing. And it was shortly after Obama sang... And so I think she was trying to do, and, and it was so powerful when he sang, you yeah. know, he sang Amazing Grace. And, and so she sings this um, original tune. And uh, <laughs> I feel like I'm being mean and this is bad karma, but it is so funny. No, it's very funny. And you're not Obama. So it's okay. <laughs> like, not everyone can be Obama. Um, okay. I think that's all the questions that we have. Thank you everyone for your participation uh, and for joining us. This is so fun. Um, May, do you want to let people know where they can follow you? Oh, yeah. Um, I'm at the May Martin on Twitter and at Hooray May on Instagram. And uh, I just want to say thanks to everyone who's said nice stuff about the show and done art and all kinds of stuff. And it, it, it's just very, I'm very pleased and touched and I appreciate it. Uh, is there anything people can do to help ensure that we get a second season? Just, just tweet if you tweet at Netflix and Channel Four and demand it. Threaten the hunger strike. No, don't. That's crazy. Sorry, that's inappropriate. But um, yeah, any tweets are are good. Okay, great. Um, and everyone, you can follow Extra everywhere at Extra Magazine. That's with an X, no E. Um, and you can find more queer pop culture content at extramagazine.com. Uh, and you can follow me on Twitter at Devin L. Murphy. 
Uh, and for everyone who's in the UK tuning in tonight on channel four at 10 PM is the fourth episode of feel good. So you should stop watching this and then go watch that because I think that's probably my favorite episode. I don't know. There was a lot going on in it. I loved it. Um, and then you can catch up to the rest of us rabid fans who watched it in one sitting. Uh, I think that's it. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, May. Thank you, Extra, for moderating and hosting. It was so cool to talk to you and uh, you too, really yeah. happy to agree to do this. Thank you so much. And I, I grew up reading Extra in Toronto. So, yeah, this is really nice. Thanks, guys. <laughs>